You're watching Thai and Tees on Saturday the 27th of October. Now we join Sue Carpenter at ITN. <laughs> The news from ITM. Thatcher uses farm talks collapse to attack France and Germany. Catholic bishop says IRA car bombers follow Satan. British diplomats return to reopen Tehran embassy. And first home win for Britain in 12 years against Australia. Good evening. Mrs. Thatcher is confronting European leaders at their summit in Rome tonight over the community's failure to cut farm subsidies. She's telling them that if they can't agree on farming policy, there's little chance of a deal on economic or political union. Agriculture Minister John Gummer accused France and Germany of despicable behaviour after talks on subsidies collapsed. European Union now was the chant from a group of demonstrators gathered outside the Palazzo Madama this evening. For Mrs. Thatcher, who wants no such thing, the chorus was especially animated. The Prime Minister has been given a powerful weapon in her efforts to stop the summiteers setting a timetable towards economic and monetary union. The row over farm price subsidies is, British officials say, evidence that the community is not yet ready for more ambitious schemes of integration. But Chancellor Helmut Kohl has already said he wants the second phase of the process towards economic and monetary union to begin in 1994. Tonight, his officials indicated that they believe that date could still be agreed at this summit. And as the meeting got underway, the Italians, who currently hold the community presidency, were making it clear that they want the issues of political, economic and monetary union, not farm subsidies, to be the first focus for the talks here. That despite the fact that Mrs. Thatcher had already made it clear at a meeting with President Mitterrand earlier that she wouldn't let the matter of farm subsidies go undiscussed. She told the French president that failure to reach agreement could threaten international trade. It's just emerged that disagreement over farm subsidies has come into the open at the summit meeting. Mrs. Thatcher apparently intervened to insist that it must be discussed. The leaders will talk about it later this evening. Edward Sturton, ITN, Rome. Subsidies to farmers in Britain and around Europe are going to have to be cut. Everyone knows that, even if, as in the case of hill farms like this one, it could mean going out of business. Countries like America are demanding cuts in the subsidies at the GATT talks on world trade. Unless Europe comes up with an acceptable package, there could be a world trade war. British farmers need, above all, a settlement. We're already in trouble with the existing common agricultural policy. So the sooner we know the commitment the community has to meet under GATT, the sooner that we can plan exactly how we're going to meet those commitments without driving uh, thousands and thousands of farmers off the land and uh, leaving nobody to look out to the countryside as well. But after 16 hours of talks, the agriculture minister had to admit there was no deal. He accused French and Germans of acting despicably, claimed that cutting subsidies was in everyone's interests, including the British. If there is a trade war, who is it who suffers? It's British farmers. They will have markets closed to them. They will find their livestock and their arable products less easy to sell. The German move seems pure politics. Their desire to protect their farmers has clearly been heightened by forthcoming elections. The French, who've already got a farming community in a state of mutiny over lamb imports, want more protection for Europe against imports. In the end, it seems, the subsidies will be cut. For some in the farming community, it's just a matter of time. Labour has gained a 16-point lead over the Tories in two opinion polls to be published tomorrow. A Sunday Times Maury poll puts Labour at 49%, the Conservatives at 33%. The Liberal Democrats have 14%, gaining mainly from the Conservatives. An Observer Harris poll gives Labour 48%, the Conservatives 32%, and the Liberal Democrats 14%. The Roman Catholic Bishop of Derry has condemned the IRA as followers of Satan for Wednesday's car bombings at two army checkpoints. He spoke out at the funeral of Patsy Gillespie, one of the so-called human bombs forced to take part in the attacks. One of the murdered soldiers was described as a hero at his funeral. Kathleen Gillespie had waited two days for final confirmation that her husband was dead. Today she left the family home where she was held at gunpoint four nights ago to walk behind Patsy Gillespie's coffin. The IRA called him a collaborator because he was a cook at an army barracks. His widow, two sons and daughter called him a good, honest family man. They've expressed anger that he was used as a human bomb. 
and at the church, which was packed with mourners, a Catholic bishop said he too was overcome with anger and distress. He said the IRA had crossed a new threshold of evil. I believe that the work of the IRA is the work of the devil. And I say that very deliberately. And I say it as a Catholic bishop, charged with preaching the gospel and charged with the pastoral care of the people of this diocese. In Carrickfergus, at the funeral of Royal Irish Ranger Cyril Smith, killed in the second identical IRA attack at Newry, a priest disclosed that the soldier had acted heroically before his death. Ranger Smith had pulled clear a 65-year-old man who had been forced to drive a van bomb into the checkpoint. He then ran back to warn other soldiers. The 21-year-old Ranger, a Catholic, was due to leave the army in six weeks' time. 63 people have been murdered in the Troubles this year, more than in the whole of 1989. In the past 10 days alone, there have been 13 killings. Andrew Simmons, ITN in Northern Ireland. President Gorbachev says there are signs that Iraq could be softening its position in the Gulf crisis. The Soviet leader's Middle East envoy, Yevgeny Primakov, arrived in Baghdad tonight for talks with the Iraqi foreign minister. In a survey in tomorrow's Sunday Telegraph, 85% said Edward Heath was right to go to Baghdad to free hostages. It also shows 60% back military action. The importance of Soviet emissary Primakov's visit was emphasized tonight by the man waiting to greet him, Foreign Minister Tarek Aziz. Primakov, who's just visited London and Washington, may be the last senior diplomat to come to Baghdad during the present crisis. His government's message is that while international unity remains, the Soviets are committed to pursuing a diplomatic solution. The Iraqis believe such a commitment is totally absent in America and Britain, and ministers here have been quick to point up this difference. You know that we are friends with the uh, Soviet Union, and we make a dialogue about the problem. The Iraqis are also friends with France, or were, and would once again like to be which is one reason why these Frenchmen in their embassy here are happily preparing to leave the country. All 307 French nationals have permission to go, and they're leaving tomorrow, whether or not their contracts are finished. No one else is in this happy position. There could, of course, be another reason for all this favorable treatment of the French and the Soviets, whose presidents will meet together in Paris this weekend. And that is a final attempt by the Iraqis to isolate what they believe are the Franco-Soviet doves from the Anglo-American hawks. Desmond Hamill, ITN, Baghdad. Five British diplomats are tonight on their way to Iran to reopen the embassy after diplomatic links were cut last year. Chargé d'affaires David Redaway said persuading Iran to release businessman Roger Cooper and getting hostages out of Lebanon were his top priorities. These are the six who will open up the British embassy in Tehran tomorrow after a gap of 19 months. There are five foreign office officials plus the wife of the first secretary. They're led by David Redaway, an Iranian specialist. Two years ago, Mr. Redaway visited Tehran and tried unsuccessfully to negotiate the freedom of the Beirut hostages and the British businessman, Roger Cooper. Well, he also is a very high priority, and I'll be asking to see him um, as soon as I can after arrival. Mr. Redaway will be the charge d'affaires. The appointment of a full ambassador is still some way off. The last British diplomat was withdrawn from Tehran after Iran condemned the British author Salman Rushdie to death. That threat has never been withdrawn, but the new Iranian government under Hashemi Rafsanjani has promised it won't interfere in other countries' affairs. The Iranians also claim they are trying to get the three British hostages in the Lebanon released, but there are reports that the Hezbollah Shiites are still demanding the release of their men in Israel before they hand over the hostages. As part of the improvement in relations, the Iranians will open up a new embassy within the next few days, just along from the building the SAS stormed 10 years ago. David Rose, ITN, Central London. American congressmen have finally agreed to big tax increases to cut the country's budget deficit. They also backed plans for huge cuts in public spending. The Senate is discussing the bill now. It should back it in a few hours, ending five months of wrangling between President Bush and Congress. Now, with news of that rugby win at Wembley and the rest of today's sport, here's Charles Smith. 
A great day for Great Britain's rugby league team. In a magnificent match at Wembley, they beat Australia by 19 points to 12 to win the first British cold test. Man of the match was Britain's captain Ellery Hanley. It's the first win over the Aussies here for 12 years. Britain looked anything like the underdogs they were supposed to be in the first half, fully stretching the experienced Australians with the backing of a record 52,000 supporters. Two all at half time, all the tries came in a superb second half. Hanley making the first one for Britain, wriggling round the defence, brilliantly chipping ahead and setting it all up for winger Eastwood. But the Australians aren't world champions because they give in. Seven minutes later, typical quick passing down the line set up their captain Meninga for a chance he wasn't going to waste. Britain struck back quickly. Once again, it was a Hanley kick that did it. Panic in the Australian defence. And a delighted Martin Afire was there to touch down. The Australians came back again. McGaw, a charging run, shrugging off tackles. Sheer strength and persistence taking him to the line and his side to win one point of Great Britain. But the British had the memorable last word. Schofield, a superb chip and gather. Powell onto Eastwood for his second try and an outstanding win that's really set up the three-match Ashes series. No wonder the captain looked proud at the end. In Rugby Union there was nearly an upset at Lansdowne Road in Dublin where Ireland played Argentina in the first official test between the countries. It looked like victory for the tourists when they scored from a pushover in extra time. That try was converted to put the Argentines 18-17 in front, but seconds later, Ireland were awarded a penalty and captain Michael Kiernan converted to win the match by 20 points to 18. Soccer and no mistakes today from the champions. After last week's draw at Norwich, Liverpool were back to their winning ways, beating Chelsea 2-0 at Anfield. Ian Rush put the champions in front, Steve Nicholl got the second. That win keeps Liverpool four points clear at the top. Arsenal stay in second place, a Lee Dixon penalty near the end, seeing off Sunderland. John Humphrey scored his first goal for fourth place Palace. Their unbeaten run now extends to ten matches. And Tottenham stay third today. From one goal down, they came back to beat Nottingham Forest. 25 years on and Clough's management style is as eccentric as ever. The warning to his team, unmistakable. Keep as close to Gascoigne as Fleet Street photographers. They did, but it still wasn't close enough. After that scare, Forrest settled down, Jensen burst through and began the move which gave them the lead. Clough Jr. perfectly placed to crack the Spurs' defence. And for the rest of the half, it looked like Clough Sr.'s anniversary would be one for the scrapbook. His latest young discovery, Roy Keane, almost making it two. But in the second half, Spurs fought their way back in, Lineker almost fashioning a spectacular equaliser. But it came after 68 minutes. Gascoigne's run ending in a ruck of bodies. A lucky break giving David Howells the opening. From then on, Howells was never out of the action, clearing off the line from Crosby after Walker's blocked shot. And one minute later, the last of the match, heading the winner. The Spurs manager was under suspicion for daylight robbery. Another surprise from the Saints, they tripped up the leaders at Tannadice. United, though, still lead the table by one point from Aberdeen. Racing and Willie Carson just missed out in the prestigious Breeders' Cup sprint at Belmont Park, New York. Riding the British favourite De Jour, he was beaten by a neck by the American horse safely kept. Meanwhile, in today's big race at Doncaster, victory went to Peter Davis after a thrilling finish in the Racing Post Trophy. Post Trophy from Peter Davis rallying well, coming up very close. Peter Davis in fact, he can just get up there. Or could he? It's close, coming to the line. Oh, I don't think I can separate them. That's one for the. The odds Peter Davis was a two to one joint favourite, while second place Mukadama was priced at 100 to 30. Finally, in case you didn't know, British summertime ends tonight, which means the clocks go back and there's an extra hour in bed. The changeover officially takes place at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning when we go back one hour to 1 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. And that's the news so far this evening. There will be ITN bulletins throughout the night. I'm back at one o'clock tomorrow. Good evening.
is the government split on Europe? I'll be interviewing Sir Geoffrey Howe, the Deputy Prime Minister, on Sunday at 1.10 on ITV. Good evening. Well, by now everyone will be aware of the warnings of possible severe weather for some parts of the south on Monday. In fact, if you read some of this morning's alarmist newspaper headlines, you may well be listening to the forecast from beneath the bedclothes. But fear not, things aren't as bad as they seem. That's the cause of all the excitement, a developing area of low pressure still out in the Atlantic, even by the middle of tomorrow. But it is coming our way, it's deepening, and there will be some probably storm force winds around, mostly down in the channel by Monday. We'll keep you posted. But at the moment, we've still got low pressure close by, plenty of rain around during tonight, and strong winds too. The rain spreading up from the southwest, some of it fairly heavy. The far north of Scotland, well, one or two showers, but nothing more than that. The winds mainly from the south or southwest and up to gale force or possibly severe gale force around the coast. On to tomorrow, those winds have blown most of the cloud away. It's still up in the northeast without breaks of rain. Brighter but showery weather spreading on behind it, as you can see. Quite a bit of sunshine for a time, I think. But during the afternoon, cloud will return again, especially down to the south and west. And there'll be some rain to return, probably to the Channel Isles, I think, during the afternoon, and possibly to the south coast later in the day. Up in the far north, it's brightened up again, as you can see. One or two showers around, but there will be some sunshine. The temperatures tomorrow, quite cold, especially in that northeastern corner, with the low pressure and winds from the north. Nine's only 48. Down in the south, 11 or 12, fairly miserable, 54. That's it from me. Here's the national summary. In the Tyne Tees region, tomorrow will start dull and cloudy with patchy rain in places, but it should become drier and brighter by the afternoon, although the odd shower is still possible. Temperatures around 11 Celsius, 52 Fahrenheit, and the moderate to fresh southeasterly winds turning to a more westerly by the end of the morning. And that's the forecast for the Tyne Tees region.